Hello, I'm your host, Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. It's going to be quite a busy week this week up in um, Concord. And so what I'll do is I'll touch on a few of the little things that went on last week and what's going to go on this week. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I'll <clears throat> talk about is sometimes I get frustrated at myself because I want to do the best quality show as um, possible. And of course, we here at um, Cheshire TV, while they try to do a great job with the limited resources they have, it's not like um, regular TV where you have an earphone and they're feeding all the questions into you and giving you all the answers, so that makes you look like um, <clears throat> a genius, I guess. Or not like where you'll see people on some of the morning talk shows or the regular news shows where they're bending their head this way or that way so they can read the um, teleprompter. We, we try to do our best here, and so I apologize sometimes when I go down to, um, to read. And plus, you know, with a teleprompter, it's pretty easy to read a teleprompter and come across, but sometimes bending in the glare of the lights, we don't always get to um, see everything and sound the way we would like to. So trying to do better, and we'll see what we can do. And before I start with... Um, <clears throat> The Concord News, one of the news that was in the um, all over the headlines today was the the Army Staff Sergeant, I guess you have to use the right word, who allegedly went on a rampage um, the other day, um, yesterday in Afghanistan, shooting, six, shooting and killing 16 people, a number of women and, and children. Um, there's nothing that we can do or even think of to excuse um, anything that he did in there. And, but sometimes we would have to go and look at, is that a rational event? No, it's not a rational event. Is, I don't know the individual, but to, <clears throat> to justify it as a rational event, that you would have to say that in, it, this individual is just pure evil. I don't know if, he ha if he's married or he has some children, but he had three tours in, um, Iraq, and this was his fourth combat tour, and so chances are he may have a family, and so a rational event would not, you would not want to risk um, getting killed or being put to death for such an event like this and cause an unbelievable pain on your family, pain and suffering. But it goes to the question is, how much is enough before um, our men and women in uniform um, reached a breaking point. And there were people on the radio who said, well, the SEALs and the Special Forces and other units have gone a number of times. The, I heard of one um, Air Force individual who said he went, he was deployed nine times. And so people automatically go nine times. But every one of his um, deployment <clears throat> was up to 90 days. Some of the, um, the soldiers that went, the Marines, they deployed a number of times, but they deployed seven months at a time. There was a period in, during the surge that the, um, some of the soldiers were deploying 18 months out at a time. So you go 18 months, go back for a year, and then even if you um, only deployed for 12 months, so basically you would have been gone 30 out of 42 months and that would only um, count as two tours for the Army, while the Air, for the Air Force guy, that would count as the equivalent of, of 10 tours. So everything is not black and white. And so special ops and certain other ones, they get a totally different type of training. They have a totally different mindset. Um, the Marine Corps, for example, has one of the longest boot camps, and it has to, you have to complete the crucible to be able to earn the title of Marine. You're in a unit, you go seven months, you come back home as a unit. It, it's part of that group. Some of the Army individuals, the Army is under a, a lot of pressure. It's a pretty big unit. The Army has been bearing a lot of the brunt of the, the war in Afghanistan and the war that just ended in Iraq. They have to do it over and over again. And <clears throat> as a result of it, the Army has let down its standards to, to fill the, um, the uniforms. 
And so the question is, if, when you leave, um, lower your standards, you've had people who are not, no longer high school graduates. Prior to the Iraq Afghan war, everyone had to be a high school graduate. That has dropped off. Other ones, some people may have had some psychological problems or whatever, but that's dropped off a little bit. <clears throat> the, um, the Army, it's, it's just one. They, they have to get their bodies, and for a while they would even give exemptions to people that had um, some criminal record. So it was all adding up, and it's, it's an awful lot to ask for a lot of these individuals. And there is a breaking point because we keep talking about the one percenters, the one percenters. There's another group of one percenters. It's our soldiers and sailors, Marines, Air Force men, Coast Guard, men and women. Only about one percent of all the people in the United States have a family member in the military and even less go off to, to combat. <clears throat> so maybe with the politicians and the other ones, Maybe they need to stop putting a flag on their um, lapel and saying, I'm a patriot, or putting a flag on their lapel and questioning other people's patriotism. Maybe they should be using that time and effort to decide what to do for these young men and women. Because a lot of these young men and women, as they're coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, there's no jobs. Uh, <clears throat> the Iraq-Afghan veterans have the highest unemployment rate of the history of American veterans. If you go back to World War II and then you compare Social Security records and everything, the veterans of World War II and the veterans of Korea, they came back to jobs and they were able to get good jobs. And Social Security records show that of the highest cohort group of earning um, Social Security benefits is veterans. This isn't happening this time around. There is just no room we are not creating jobs um, for veterans. And for a great majority of people, they want to do that flag. They want to go to Veterans Day and Memorial Day. The politicians want your vote, but they're forgetting about these guys, these men and women. So you, what do you do? You're 24, 25, 26 years old. You spent three, four years in the military. You spent a year plus in the combat zone. What do you do? Plain and simple, there's a question. Do we actually... We need to look ourselves in the mirror and do we care about these individuals? And as like I said before, what Teddy Roosevelt says, these veterans expect no more than anybody else, any other American, but they deserve no less than any other American. And I think we need to um, hold ourselves up to that, that standard, especially for um, female veterans. Female veterans are having it brutally tough nowadays. <clears throat> We've got women who had to leave their children and go for 12, 18 months and come back. Anybody who's been a parent, if you have a two, three-year-old child, 12, 18 months is a lifetime for a lot of those, um, those children. And so how does a mother reintegrate into being a mother and being in a family member? And what are we as a society doing to help her? My question is, I don't think we're doing enough. And I think way too many of us are just looking the other way because it doesn't pertain to us, which is a really sad state. And so while we're talking about plain and simple, when I was listening to the news this morning and um, we had presidential candidates talking about whether they ate grits or not, you know what? And I said, wait a minute, grits, maybe we should have, um, like John Wayne, we should have some political leaders with true grit and not stop talking about eating grits. Because I added it up. When I took the American time that we fought the American Civil War, the time we fought World War I, and we fought World War II, you add all those up, the time for those three major wars, and we've spent more time in Afghanistan than the Civil War, World War I, and World War II combined. And we're spending right now still about $2 billion a week. We're getting pretty close to spending about a, a trillion dollars in Afghanistan, almost 2,000 uh, men and women, American men and women dead. You know what? True grit, John Wayne would ask, say, is this the right thing to do? If it isn't the right thing to do, 
why aren't we manning up and doing the right thing? If, <clears throat> if we decide that we can't win it, you don't look for retreat with grace or victory with grace. You do the right thing. If you're in a bad situation, you get out as quickly as possible. And otherwise, more people will die, more treasure will be spent, and we may have some more um, serious problems like this. This was in Afghanistan. We just recently um, arrested a young man, a Marine in, um, in Southern California, suspected of killing five homeless men. He did his time in the service, and then he was dropped out. No one else took care of him. So we're treating these individuals to be warriors, killers, and then we say, sorry, we have no need for you. You gotta decompose them, you gotta decompress them, otherwise we're in um, big trouble. Okay, up to the um, shenanigans in, in Concord. Um, last week, the, um, <clears throat> the majority leader Betancourt went up and made a motion, and part of the motion was, was to limit debate on any discussion to 20 minutes, excuse me, 10 minutes on each side, and no one could speak more than five minutes, and that 10 minutes included questions. And the justification was, it says, hey, we're way behind schedule, and we gotta get this done. Behind schedule? We're behind schedule because Betancourt and O'Brien and Bates and other ones have been trying to mess up and shenangle right to work, marriage equality, a whole bunch of these other issues and trying to figure when can we get it the best, when are we going to have the right amount of people so we can slide it through. Well, the House overwhelmingly supported that. And so just think 10 minutes, that's all you have. So we have 400 people elected to represent the people of New Hampshire. If I go up and then someone else goes up with me, we both speak five minutes, no one else who supports that bill, if we're going in support of a bill, will be allowed to speak. We effectively, we're doing this, we've effectively ensured that the majority of the voters in New Hampshire will no longer have any voice for we have now, the House has now silenced the ability for anybody after that 10 minutes. You can't even ask a question. If I went up and spoke five minutes and you had a question of what I said, you can, and the time's up, the speaker says time's up, you cannot ask any questions. So if I went up there for five minutes and I gave all false information and the clock ran out, no one could ask me a question to challenge the veracity or the truthfulness of what I was saying. <clears throat> that is not a democracy. That's not even a republic form of government. A republic form of government is you elect somebody, there's almost 3,500 people per every representative, and we're saying right now, sorry, your representative can't talk to you because we're limiting it to 10 minutes. So we're, we could possibly dis, um, decide the future of marriage equality, the future of right to work, a number of other issues, the future of how we're going to fund education in the state of New Hampshire, 10 minutes, that's it. The reason is some of the reps say, you know what, I'm sick and tired, I got better things to do, I don't want to listen to this yabba yabba yabba. Well, if you don't want to listen to this yabba yabba yabba, have some personal integrity, resign and have someone else who comes in who wants to listen. Other people say, you know what, I got things to do, I got to be out of here at five o'clock. Well, there's been times in the past that we've gone to 10, 11 o'clock, we've gone on Wednesday and Thursday, but no, we've been going out five o'clock and sometimes earlier. Um, we had a week's vacation, we didn't go to touch anything. Last week, we left about five o'clock, a little bit after five o'clock. Representative Betancourt was totally ticked off that a number of the votes didn't go his way. And he brought, it, he brought in the majority of the um, Republican caucus and chewed him out. You could hear him standing outside the hall, in the hallway, you could hear him yelling. And <clears throat> to me, I went home disgusted, but I couldn't understand who I was more disgusted for. 
was I more disgusted that a 28-year-old guy is chewing out all these people because they showed some form of independence and they were thinking for themselves? And I'm saying is, me, these guys are adults, they're the elders. You may disagree with them, but you need to respect them. You don't go out and throw them, throw them out, chew them, chew them out like they're, they're little kids. Or I'm going is, these guys are elders, and why are they putting up with this 28-year-old, I call him a kid, who hasn't done anything, hasn't really been challenged in anything, allowing them to chew him out because they were thinking their mind. They were voting for the, the people that elected them. It's, it's a really sad state in American politics and for our future if we, with both Democrat or Republican, must owe our loyalty or take a loyalty pledge to the party leadership. Well, if you look at history, there's a lot of nations where people have taken a loyalty pledge to the party leadership, and no country has benefited from that. And so it, it just really um, frustrated me. And because one of the things that really got it was going was we had a bill that if someone was in um, prison, if they went and worked and got their GED, high school diploma, or associate's degree, or a bachelor's degree while in prison, they would be eligible up to 90 days early release. It wasn't a mandatory 90 day early release. It was a thing that the parole board would take in consideration after they completed their minimum sentence. It was no way in any way was going to reduce the minimum sentence. The Benton court didn't like where it was going, tried to get it tabled. He lost the tabling, and then he brought up a number of people. One individual says, you know what? I don't want pedophiles and rapists let go 90 days early. You know what? If you get a high school diploma while in prison and you're a pedophile and you, you, don't ma you don't meet the parole requirements, you don't get paroled. Plain and simple. Texas and a number of other states have realized if you're going to release somebody, they have to be able to go out and get a job so they can earn money, have a place to, um, to live. And it works. Otherwise, people end up right back in, in jail. And so... You ever try to get a job in the United States now without a high school diploma? It ain't happening very much. Perfect example is Georgia. There was a recent article in Georgia. Georgia is spending millions of dollars for prisoners who are eligible for parole, but they can't get jobs. And because they can't get jobs, they can't find a place to live. And to be able to get paroled, you have to have an, um, an address. But here in New Hampshire, we say, nope, we'll just keep them in here. And it's like 90 days is not a lot of time. If you're spending five, 10 years in prison, and I can go in and tell you, get your diploma, get your AA, and you can get out in up to 90 days early. You could qualify to get up to 90 days early, and then they have a good chance of getting a job. Um, I don't understand what we were <clears throat> missing here up in... Um, New Hampshire. <clears throat> the, some of the other ones that were, you, you just sit here and shake your head, was um, <clears throat> relating to felons to possess um, firearms. That was voted down, but they're saying that just because you commit a felony and you did your time, you should be able to um, have a firearm. Um, basically, Firearm possession while, while trapping and basically some fish and game requirements. I, you know, if you're out there trapping, you don't bring a weapon. And they're saying is, and it passed, that if you're out there trapping, you need to have the right to um, self-protect you. And so it's really important that you be able to have a weapon. Somehow it doesn't, to me, it doesn't appear like the mountain men where you're worrying about beaver and mink trapping and someone trying to kill you and take your, um, your furs. The other one right here, it was passed, but we don't know who's going to pay for it, 
It requires the vision of state police to equip special weapons and tactical SWAT teams with tactical cameras. Well, those cameras are pretty expensive. I've been told some of them cost up to $20,000 each. It doesn't say who's going to pay for them, who, when are you going to use them, who's going to store the video, who's going to have access for the video, but it just came into some of the um, paranoia that was, that's going on up there. And it's <clears throat> the other one is a constitutional amendment, which finally was referred to interim study, CACR 21, which would allow the voters to veto any to veto any law by referendum. So if the House passes a law and there's a group of voters say, you know what, I don't like that law, let's put a referendum on the ballot and we can veto it. And so basically you could have an election if there's 20, 30, 40 laws that people don't like and these groups get together and they get the required amount of signatures, you could go having 40 different um, referendum issues do I vote to repeal this law or that law? And it goes on and on, utterly um, chaos. But you go, wait a minute. So if I don't go and like the fact that if I have more than a marijuana is a crime, and say if it requires 25,000 signatures, I get 25,000 signatures, then it goes on the ballot, and then it goes for the vote. Even if it doesn't pass, it's going to cost a heck of a lot of money to go through these. <clears throat> Another one that was um, majority ought to pass with amendment, HB 1216, related to the, the authority for withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment. Well, this bill restores constitutional protection for the most valuable members of a society at the most vulnerable time. Under current law, life-sustaining treatment can be withheld or withdrawn from a legally incapacitated person if that person has a valid, executed, advanced directive. Such action is authorized by an existing guardian or another court order, or three, such action is taken with the facility standard protocols applicable to the general patient population. So the members of the committee says, wait a minute, if I have an advanced directive, I have do not resuscitate, or I've given my power of attorney to um, someone, or yeah, I'm in a facility that has a laid out procedure, they're saying, sorry, if I have an advanced directive that says it's time for me to go, if <clears throat> my wife can go and say, yes, it's time for me to go, and the facility and the doctor says, you know, in these known procedures, he's lived a long life, productive life, but it's time to go, well, despite all those three, what they're saying right now with the passage of this, that's no longer my right. It says, because the committee felt greater protections were warranted for our most vulnerable citizens, the committee eliminated the third option. And um, basically, for example, one facility may choose to terminate a patient's life while a decision in another facility could be totally different. And so... <clears throat> Basically, it's one of those, yeah, I could have my advanced directive. Yes, my wife can say yes, and then the facility can go and say yes. But someone else can come along and say, well, the facility is saying, in the facility is saying, let this happen. And the facility has unlawfully influenced me or my wife to make a decision. So then you would have to then go to court, one, to, to prove the fact, my wife would then have to go to court to prove the fact that the facility wasn't unduly influencing her to make that decision. And in the meantime, she could go to court or someone else can go to court and say, no, he needs to be transferred to a facility that may put him on life support and keep him around for a while longer or a long longer. Okay. So, again, so while we're not we're talking about contraceptives and abortion, but they're also going to the other way. And me, I find it really strange. We're talking both ways, but 
We don't want to pay for health care. We don't want to pay for education. There's a whole bunch of things that we don't want to pay for. So we want to say, have all these unwanted babies, allow these people to live forever, no matter how, what their quality of life is, but we're not going to pay for it. Society's not going to pay for it. Taxpayers are not going to pay for it. And so, again, this is some of the reasons why up in Concord, they want to get this done in less than 10 minutes because if it takes more than 10 minutes, people start thinking, people start asking the questions. And so that's the scary part. And so what we're going to do right now, a little bit different, we're going to go to a little clip from a local artist. He wrote this song, composed this song, and he lives in Brattleboro, A.J. LeVert. And I think you're going to like this song, and then we'll come back and use the magic whiteboard. So we'll be back in a few minutes. Sitting like 
light shine bright on our eyes, allowing us to hide in this miserable disguise. No moon, no stars can show us the way. Spending the night in bling away For planting that night in bling away <clears throat> Well, hope you enjoyed that song and um, it's amazing the amount of local talent that we have uh, around here. Like I said, an individ the individual is from um, Brattleboro and he just likes to sit down and um, write some songs and compose it and, and sing it. Good individual and, um, <clears throat> like I said, quality, quality individual, quality song. What we're going to do today, we're going to talk about some deficit numbers and um, a little bit about Greece and how do we get the, this debt and how come no one wants to talk about it. And like I said this morning, a little bit earlier that this morning, uh, on the Republican side of the house, everyone is talking about grits, grits with bacon, grits with butter. I don't know if I've ever had grits. Well, you know what? This is a little bit more, um, I think, important. This is one of the biggest reasons we have the debt It's growing is because of Social Security. Social Security used to be a standalone um, <clears throat> budget item, but to help cover up some of the... Um, budget deficits, <clears throat> the president and Congress took it from standalone and included it into um, the budget because there was always a surplus in Social Security, so it always made the, um, the budget deficit look smaller. And even in the case, if we go back to President Clinton with his surplus, if you took out the Social Security um, surplus, the federal government was actually running um, a deficit. And Social Security kind of reminds me of, the, there was an old movie when I was growing up, it was called Logan's Run, where basically you could have everything, you were promised anything you wanted until you were about 30 years old, then you had to go to this um, chamber, and then you would run, and you said if, hey, if you made it to the top, <clears throat> you would, um, you'd be able to get the start all over again. Well, the theory about the story was it was kind of like big sham because no one ever made it to the top. The elders, which were older, they had rigged the game so no one would make it to the top. But people would then see them and say, wait a minute, they're older, they're successful, so I have a chance. It was that hope. Logan messed up the game because Logan made it to the top. And so he kind of destroyed the whole um, the fallacy of the game. When Social Security was first started, in 19, if you were born in 1934 and you were white, you had, and it, combining them, you had a life expectancy of 61.1. If you were born in 1941, you had a life expectancy of 64.8. Why is this important? Because when you looked at Social Security, you were supposed to make it to 65 to collect your first check. So based on the way it was set up, the majority, quite a few people would pay a lot of money into Social Security and never collect a penny. Especially um, if you had a wife, then she could collect the widow's portion, but it would always be um, smaller. So like for example, let's see, if you were born in 1934 and you had 65, that was 1999, 1999, a woman got $697 for Social Security, a man got 904 or an average of 757 If the woman was um, a widow, she'd get $776. And so basically, if the woman had never worked and um, <clears throat> she died, basically she would get about $130 a month less than her husband. And so, again, it would benefit the system. Now, if you were non-white, black, Hispanic, Latino, middle <clears throat> um, Native American, in 1934, you had a life expectancy of 51.8. In 1941, 53.8. So, basically, 
if you were born in 1941 and you're a Native American or, um, or black, you would have to live almost 12 years past your life expectancy just to um, collect a, a check. So it was a good way to make people feel really good. It was a good way to help people that, that made it past here. But it basically it was a system that wasn't going to pay out as much as it was um, projected to pay out because, as you could see, most people would not have um, reached the, quite a few of the people would not have reached the age. But now, <clears throat> if we go to the year 2010, the closest, if you were 65 in 2010, you're expected, Social Security says you can expect to live another 183 months, a little bit more than 15 years, three months. I'm using the meal pot. And so, again, to make it easy and not get really stuck in the details, the Social Security, they collect, they're, they're based on 30, your best 35 years after the age of um, 21. So if you made $40,000 a year for 35 years, <clears throat> basically you would have paid in $86,800. If you're self-employed or you use, you would pay 173,000. And if you count the employee match, you would say 173,000 for the, the sake of argument. But the thing is, just because the, just because the, if the employee did not have to match it, it doesn't mean he's going to give you another $86,000 over that 35-year period. And so. Basically, I put that 173 in because if you're self-employed, you have to pay both pots. Well, if you get $40,000, make 40000 for 35 years, your check based on 20, um, right here, my closest one, 2011, 2010, no, 2011, would be $1,183. So if you lived another 183 months, you would collect $216,000 from Social Security. So that would be a shortfall, $129,000. Even if you um, self-employed and count that, that's still a shortfall of $42,000. So basically, every person that makes 65 and lives the projected 15.3 months, and they had made 40,000, again, rounding it off to make it simple, they're basically short. The Social Security Fund is short $130,000 per person. Now, if you made $100,000 and your max would be $2,531, you would have paid $217,000 in and you would have received $459,000. Again, but that's a shortfall of $242,000. If you're self-employed, like the doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you paid in both part, then it's a shortfall of $25,877. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> basically what's happening is it doesn't matter where you go on the pitch. If you're making 100000 or 40000 <clears throat> Social Security is not making um, it up. The money's numbers are not there. So if my wife was a doctor and made 100000 and and I was a working Walmart manager and made $40,000, basically when you look at it, <clears throat> there would have been a shortfall of $370,000 if we go from 65 and then we lived another 18 years. That's $370,000 between the two of us. So... Every three couples that fell in that category, that's a million dollar shortfall. Where does that money come from? There's a good question because less and less people are working. What makes it even dip more difficult is Medicare. You'd only have to pay 19,000 or you double it up 39,000. Medicare here is 50,000 or a total of 101,000. Get a hip replacement or a knee replacement or a quadruple bypass. $50,000. My last pacemaker was $37,000. So again, that's one of the reasons why Medicare is going down, down the tubes because if I have one pacemaker that's $37,000, if I go in and um, live 18 years, 
15 years, I could expect at least two more pacemakers. So just my pacemakers alone would be $75,000. Again, there's a, a shortfall. So Social Security is not sustainable. Medicare is not sustainable. And again, none of the politicians want to talk about it. They want to talk about al algae in your gas tank and grits with butter or without butter, which is really scary. Why are these important? because we go to the debt. Right now, the debt is $15.7 trillion. And of that $15.7 trillion, it's round off about 12%, about 12 trillion of it, it's on um, the government has to pay interest. Because part of it is the government is, owes about $2 trillion to um, Social Security and uh, Medicare, and it's not really paying interest to itself. And it's using funds that are coming in from workers today to help offset the ones, the money that's going out. But it, this is the problem where it comes to compared to, to Greece. At $12 trillion, if the government borrows at 2%, it's going to pay $240 billion per year in interest. 4%, $480 billion, 6%, $720 billion. Greece just went in a managed default. And when you look at the price of its bonds, its long-term bonds, it's going up. Italy right now is about 6%, and we went up to about 8%. Spain is in that range, too. So the Federal Reserve has stated that it's going to excuse me, keep the bonds rates really low excuse me, for the next two years. Because <clears throat> just as simple, just think, 2%, just going up 2% from 2 to 4 the, we as taxpayers are going to have to come up with $240 billion in interest alone. Plain and simple, $240 billion just to pay the credit, credit card and get nothing in return. But the nasty part is in 2016, our debt, if everything works right, our debt will only be $20 trillion. Look at that, only $20 trillion. Well, here again, look at these 300 so in the year 2016, we could be spending $320 billion just in interest at 2%, 4%, 6%. If it goes up to 6% in 2016, $960 billion that we will be forced to pay. And at $960 billion compared to the budget right now, we would be saying is, <clears throat> almost 30 cents on every single dollar that the government spends will go just to pay interest. Just think of it. 30 cents on every dollar. I, I, I just go there and I, I, I scratch my head and I go, you know, this is not the, the future I want for my children, my grandchildren. And people are talking about especially as baby boomers, you're in your 50s or your 60s and saying, this is not the future I want for my, my children, my grandchildren. It's like, duh, 2016 isn't that far away. That's four years away. The baby boomers need to start realizing they're talking about their future. Their future is now. And in, in 2016, the federal, if the inflation rate goes up to 6% or higher and the federal government has to, um, <clears throat> to pay that for bonds, that 640, look at that the equivalent, $640 billion of what we're spending money on right now, we will have to make $640 billion a year in cuts just to cover our interest payments in order that our yearly deficit doesn't go from 1.3 trillion to two, three, two, $2 trillion a year. Because every time it goes up, this number goes higher and higher. And if the, it's gonna to get to a point like Greece, when this number goes higher and higher, this number will go higher. Plain and simple, if it goes to 8%, we're talking 1.3 trillion dollars. The deficit for 2012-2013 is projected for 1.3 trillion dollars. And what are we going to get from that 1.3 trillion dollars? 
We're not going to get much, but we're going to get something. But if we have to pay $1.3 trillion in interest, what are we going to get? We ain't getting nothing. Plain and simple. We're just not going to get anything. It's going to be, it's just going to suck the, the life out of the economy. And to me, that's um, extremely important. And so just food for thought. And next time a politician comes, say, show a little true grit and stop talking about grits because grit, I've had them once. They're pretty nasty. They're not corn of wheat, cream of wheat. They're nasty. So we're going to end up with a little short um, five-minute clip at the end, so I'm not going to be back. So I just want to let you know I enjoyed having the time with you, and I'll see you out there on the long road, and hopefully I'll survive my five days in Concord this week. So again, enjoy the warm weather. Aloha. This is Mike Young from Wave Riders Against Drugs. Mahalo for supporting our drug educational efforts. Surfing, once only the sport of Hawaiian kings, is proving to be an excellent way of reaching out. The positive drug-free message by professional water athletes is working and is being well received by thousands of children throughout Hawaii and in California. And also, mahalo to the many friends, artists, musicians, the surfing community, and the Kauai Visitors Bureau for their help in making this Aloha Collection possible. Regardless of where you are, we hope you enjoy this slice of island life. Aloha and God bless.
mountains green. 